Greetings, splice strategists, and welcome to Alexandria, Egypt for Operation Necessary Wit. If you were expecting an Egyptian accent, well, get used to disappointment because I have no clue what an Egyptian accent actually sounds like. In other news, the Denver Broncos and Seattle Seahawks are going to the Super Bowl. I say this to all you non-sports watching nerds so that you can fake your way through everyday conversation. Should you be tested on this knowledge, know that the Broncos are led by Peyton Manning and have scored more points than any other offense in NFL history. The Seahawks, in contrast, got to the Super Bowl behind the power of a tough as nails, kick your teeth in, and other sorts of aggressive sounding phrases, defense. If you know nothing about actual football but need to blend in, you can say something like, it's the irresistible force versus the immovable object to make it sound like you know what you're talking about. Why give you that helpful tip for casual conversation? Because at Splice Strategies, we believe that it's important to try and fit in and bringing up sectoids, overwatches, and meld will never prepare you for regular conversation. That is a Splice Strategies guarantee. In even more news, I never feel comfortable with the way guarantee is spelled. And there is actually a mission going on right now that I probably should be talking about. So if you didn't notice, I used Jimmy's new battle scanner ability to throw a remote camera and see what's going on ahead. That's the glowing radar thing you see out in the distance. A keen observer might have noticed that it revealed two seekers hiding out behind that truck. So you know Ferris Queen's excited for the possibility of more hugs. In reality, Pharaoh's Queen has filed a restraining order against the squid bots, so it's actually the opposite of that. And Jimmy has appointed herself as the enforcer of said restraining order. And now you can see one of the awesome things about the squad site with battle scanner combo. Jimmy can use the battle scanner to self-spot her own squad site shots. I file that combination in a folder labeled awesome. Now, the behavior of the other Seeker here perplexes me. Normally after shooting one alien in a group, the others activate. I'm not sure if it's a bug, but the other Seeker doesn't seem to activate at all. So maybe it's a glitch or something, or maybe it's a tactical decision because it can't see us and doesn't want to try and stealth in the middle of a battle scanner being active. Or heck, maybe it's just rebooting after a crash or something. Man, is it going to be really confused when it loads back up and its partner's gone. Regardless, it's just staying there, and we're okay with that. It gives us an opportunity to move Pharaoh's Queen up and capture the meld. Now, normally I wouldn't take a 45% shot here, but I A, want to give Pharaoh's Queen a chance to get promoted, and B, like the idea that she's so traumatized by the last robot squid hug she got that she doesn't care about the odds and now has a set in stone policy that all squids must burn. Unfortunately, it seems Pharaoh's Queen is just an inch too short to shoot over the police vehicle. And it needs to be pointed out, she shot the roof of the squad car, so of course the entire thing is now burning in flames and threatening to blow up. What is it about near-future engineering that makes every vehicle explode as easily as a Yugo? You'd think police cruisers would be made of tougher stuff, you know? So we move Beto Burr up and see if he has a good shot. And while 59% isn't bad, it isn't good either. The squids aren't limited to squeezing people though, and can shoot. So I make use of Beto Burr's new suppression ability that puts the Seeker at a negative 30% chance to hit if it does decide to shoot. Nice. Everyone else goes into Overwatch. But we've now got more problems as two more X-rays show up. And while I'm pleased with the shot, it seems someone has replaced Gemini's Spark's minigun with a freeze ray. Look, it's like Gemini killed the alien, then took it to a taxidermist to get it posed for his trophy room. Jeez, and you thought getting a deer's head mounted on a wall was a tough sell to your wife. How rough would it be to convince her her gray wouldn't be creepy? But why does it give you the willies, honey? It's only got vacant black soulless eyes and looks vaguely like an infant. And to top it all off, the battle scanner has run out and the squid has gone into stealth mode and moved somewhere else. But as I said before, Jimmy is going to enforce that Pharaoh's Queen Robo Squid restraining order. So she throws out her last battle scanner to reveal its location. And we see that it has cleverly moved to the other side of the van. But never tell Pharaoh's Queen the odds of a shot because when it comes to her and Robo Squids, there's only one option. Kill them with fire! Everyone can now breathe easy. The squids are dead. Plus, Pharaoh's Queen got a kill, so she'll get a promotion. Huzzah! Now, the non-stuffed sectoid has taken up pretty good cover, so we don't have a good shot. 
So, to get closer, we have Citrus Architect and Beetober take up half cover within Gemini's distortion field, then have Beetober use up the last of his ammo to suppress the sectoid. Though, I think his suppressing fire may have lit the truck behind the gray on fire, because two more aliens scurry away from the cab and are kind enough to take refuge in an easily flankable position. And the sectoid behind the cover is polite enough to do... nothing. We return his politeness by not firing back. Though, we do move up, and take advantage of Beetle Burst's smoke grenade to give us some cover, and have everyone else go into Overwatch. The sectoid finds the giant cyborg's gradual approach unsettling, and decides to book it. This is a poor choice though, as it's time for trick shot shenanigans with 06 Jimmy. In this segment, shooting a sectoid through a taxi's engine block with a pistol. Can Jimmy hit the shot? Indeed she can. A cheer for Jimmy. Yay. Next turn, we move Citrus Architect up to take care of our easily flanked enemies and mother pus bucket. Okay, so I decide to move Gemini to get a flank on one of these floaters, but that takes us to another edition of Trick Shot Shenanigans featuring this random sectoid. In this segment, threading the plasma burst through a vehicle and this ladder. Can the sectoid hit the shot? Indeed it can. Cheers for the sectoid. Yeah. Gemini took damage and he's mad about that. So he takes his minigun off the stun setting and sets it to kill. After that, Jimmy tells the sectoid in the back to sit its gray butt down, and Citrus Architect makes sure to pass Jimmy's message along to the previous sectoid's buddy. Now, that leaves Gemini Spark right in the last floater's crosshairs, but I think that will be okay. You see, I haven't fully playtested this, but it seems to me that a mech trooper, as long as they don't dip below 5 HP, don't visit the hospital. I think the logic is that up until 5 HP, their armor takes all the damage, though I haven't proven this yet, it's just something I've noticed. Whether or not my theory is true though, it doesn't affect my plan. Citrus is going to walk right up to the floater and find out if it's allergic to lasers. Yep. Just as I thought, they break out in a horrible rash of death. So ends Operation Necessary Wit. We collect both melt canisters, pick up Gemini's creepy taxidermic sectoid, and then pile into the Sky Ranger for a calm flight home, though everyone feels like the sectoid corpse is staring at them. No, Gemini, no matter how many times you ask, we won't let you put that on display in the game room. That can go straight into your quarters, it's freaking everyone out. Meanwhile, Back in the magical world of Promotion Land, 08 Citrus Architect has been promoted to Sergeant and earned the nickname Cobra. And I'm telling you right now that I plan on exploiting this for either some Karate Kid or G.I. Joe references in the future. You can guarantee it. In fact, why not? I'll guarantee it. As for his perks, the Sergeant level used to be a no-brainer. Lightning reflexes all the way. Lightning Reflexes guarantees the first Overwatch against the Assault will miss. No exceptions. The other choice, Close and Personal, used to just give you an extra 30% chance to crit against close enemies. Lame. But Enemy Within version of Close and Personal makes it so that the first shot you take at an enemy doesn't use up an action. Combined with some other perks, that means you could end up shooting two, three, or maybe even four times with a high-powered shotgun if the situation's right. That amount of potential offensive output makes close and personal very tempting, but it comes with a stipulation that it can't be used simultaneously with run and gun, whereas lightning reflexes always works, no stipulation. Plus, having lightning reflexes at your disposal means the bad guys gotta go into at least two overwatches to try and keep you pinned. For that reason, I'm going with the blockade busting ability of lightning reflexes. The other promotion belongs to the Squid Slayer herself, 07 Pharaoh's Queen, and she makes me happy by becoming the backup heavy behind DJ Sucre. Also, for those of you who know Pharaoh's Queen, you know that she's tiny, making her wielding a minigun possibly the most adorably violent thing in all of gaming. Now, the rest of the world is on the brink of full-blown panic, but hey, at least I have cash. Enough cash to build a satellite uplink. What a satellite uplink does is it gives you the ability to launch more satellites. How many you can launch depends with each difficulty, but at Classic and Impossible, it's two more, with one extra satellite that can be launched for every adjacent uplink. The key thing to remember is that each uplink takes four days, five power, and ten engineers to build. 
For that reason, my rule is always build them on the 15th to make sure they are ready for the satellites when the end of the month comes around. After that, it's time to clear out more space so that we can, in time, start building more facilities. Next, we head out to scan and find out that Brazil is joining Argentina in protest. Don't worry, you'll both have a shiny new satellite soon. Their complaints are drowned out by the sound of xenobiology research completing, taking us to a boring cutscene. Allow me to summarize. You want to risk soldiers' lives to capture aliens? Yeah, I only care about science and telling others how to do their job. No way, Jose. Sir, consider this. We could torture the aliens for information. Torture for intel. Y you mean like Jack Bauer? Exactly like Jack Bauer. Ballin', let's get started. With that settled, it's time to decide on our next research project. It'll take eight days to complete the arc thrower, which is the taser required to capture x-rays, but it'll be nine days before we can even clear out the space needed to build the Xeno containment unit. On top of that, it's going to be another seven days in the actual construction. Seems to me that it's silly to start research on a tool that won't be useful for another two weeks or so. So I'm going to go with the usual question of what can kill me next. Well, what can kill me next is a medium-sized UFO. Don't get me wrong, my fighters are equipped with a Phoenix cannon but that just means I might beat a medium-sized UFO. In order to assure victory, I need something else. Floater Autopsy would grant me a module that will guarantee two UFO shots will miss my fighter. Because you have to get in close to use the Phoenix Cannon, that'd be useful. So I start the Floater Autopsy and pray to the random number generator that we don't run into a medium-sized UFO- OH YOU STINKING POOSER! That's it, random number generator. I ain't never converting to incidental numeral creationism after that stunt. <sighs> okay, so before we deal with this UFO, you may have noticed my excavation's completed. So I'm going to go back to engineering to do the last of this level of excavation. With that complete, we just need to trust that our Phoenix Cannon will be enough to slag this UFO. That man is referencing Galaga, thought no one born after 1990 would notice, but they did. And while it was fun getting Pharaoh's Queen a promotion, shooting down a medium sized UFO means more ETs than usual. When it comes to lots of aliens, it's best not to mess around. So we'll send Pharaoh's Queen back to the bench and get DJ Sucre all stretched out and limbered up, because this is going to be our first run through with the complete five class ensemble that makes up our current A team. And as a bonus, there is only one location, a busted up UFO in Nowheresville, Africa. So I don't even have to worry about clicking the wrong location this time. Good stuff. Hmm. Judging by the title, looks like Bobby Percival is declaring his love for DC Comics, by the book ring slinging, and abundant applications of alliteration. Look out next week as our loyal league of lion-hearted legionnaires let loose their lasers and live artillery to lay low a loathsome lot of aliens in Operation Lawful Lantern. Until then, I'm Splice, and remember, never trust the cult of incidental numeral creationism, for the random number generator is truly the cruelest of all fictitious deities. <laughs>